All right, welcome back, everybody. Uh, this is part two of chapter three in our AP Stats curriculum. And what we are looking at in this chapter is categorical data. How do we display um, and describe categorical data? So in the last video, we talked about um, the area principle and uh, just the, the beginnings of looking at those charts in this, or in a frequency table, excuse me. Um, in this video, we're going to look at bar charts and pie charts and uh, contingency tables and uh, some of the things that have to do with those. So, the first thing we have here uh, is a bar chart, okay? And a bar chart displays the distribution of a categorical variable. Uh, it tells us the counts for each category uh, next to each other for easy comparison. Um, bar charts stay true to the area principle. Uh, thus, they, uh, as long as they're not in 3D, uh, thus they're a good display here. So notice uh, on here on the left hand bar, this uh, it's not like a traditional XY coordinate draft because the Y axis um, is the frequency, also known as the counts. Okay, uh, and the bottom, the X axis, uh, isn't necessarily in a particular order. Okay. Uh, that's the big difference between categorical and quantitative data is these these buckets as I've been describing them right uh, these buckets all uh, do not have a particular order to them I could take this crew bucket and move it to the front and make the first bucket over here and it wouldn't have a severe impact on what we were learning from the graph okay so the categorical data, these bar charts just show us counts, okay? We can see from this particular graph that in the Titanic data, the crew had the most amount of people, followed by third class, followed by first class, followed by second class. Um, but first and second class were very close to each other. And again, you can see their approximate numbers um, by just uh, looking at the y-axis where the bar starts, okay? Uh, now, pie charts, on the other hand, um, when you want to look uh, at parts of a whole, a, a pie chart might be the better display here. Uh, the, the big difference between a pie chart and a bar chart is the circle is sliced into pieces uh, whose size is proportional to the fraction of the whole in each category. So these little pie pieces that are making up are proportional to the total. So we can still see that the crew has the most, but that's because the crew has 885 out of the total amount, whereas first class has 325 out of the total amount, et cetera. So this is a uh, more of like a percentage that we might see of the total. So pie charts are really great uh, when we want to see a proportion. Uh, how much bigger is something proportional? The, the big warning here is, though, um, that if you have uh, many categories, oops, not mammy, many categories, uh, or, or small percents, uh, the pie chart is not optimal. If you have a lot of categories, you end up with um, a pie with lots and lots of slices and it's very difficult to see anything from that um, not to mention if you also have just things with small percentages and maybe like one big percentage also pie chart not optimal pie charts tend to work best when we have uh, the slices that are the the fractions that we kind of intuitively know a little bit better uh, like when we have them in terms of uh, oops in terms of fourths or eighths or halves, right? Um, any of those really common type fractions, that's when pie charts work the best. If we have really uncommon fractions, uh, it, it can be very difficult for just most people to be able to look at that display and intuitively know what it's showing, okay? So as far as categorical displays go, um, th those are the two big ones. Uh, we have another one uh, called the segmented bar chart that we'll look at a little bit later. Uh, but for now, uh, oh, I've, sorry, let's do this one. Uh, we can also look at these, uh, instead of just being a regular bar chart, we can look at what's called a relative frequency bar chart. 
And it's the same idea as a pie chart that it says it proportional counts for each category. Um, if you go back and look at these two graphs, notice how they're basically the same. This one is showing the actual counts. This one is showing the percents. Um, so keyword here is if it says relative, uh, then the relative means that we're showing percentages um, instead of the actual counts. And again, the bar charts themselves should look the same, right? Notice how those are the same. Just one of them's showing percents. Okay, sorry. All right, now let's talk about contingency tables. Um, a contingency table uh, is another way of displaying data. Uh, it displays the counts and sometimes percentages of individuals falling into named categories on two or more variables. So notice on a bar chart, we're only looking at one variable. On a contingency table, we're looking at two variables. So again, this is the Titanic data from the book. Um, we have the two variables here, uh, what class the person was in, first, second, third, or crew, and whether or not they survived, alive or dead. So we have the survival variable and the class variable as our, our two different uh, variables that we're looking at in this contingency table. Uh, this is a regular contingency table. We can also make a relative contingency table where um, we look at these as percents, okay? Uh, a couple other things that I want to point out. The things over here, these uh, rows with the total, we call these the margins. And uh, if we're looking at this whole side, we call this a marginal distribution. And all that means is <clears throat> we're looking at the numbers in the margin. We could also do a marginal distribution of the survival. A marginal distribution of the survival would be 325 out of 2,201, 285 out of 2,201, et cetera, okay? So a marginal distribution would be a distribution of the margins. It is all of the numbers in the margins. We can also make a relative marginal distribution. And when we make a relative marginal distribution, we're looking at percents, okay? So we're looking at the 325 over 2,201. That's the relative, whereas the regular marginal distribution would just be 325, 285, 706, and 885. Okay, um, each of these individual numbers, we call that a cell. Uh, if you're familiar with uh, Excel, the Microsoft program, it's the same uh, verbiage, okay? These are called cells, every number in the cell, okay? All right, let's uh, look again. Uh, so we have our contingency table. We can uh, look at very specific parts of the contingency table. And we call those very specific parts a conditional distribution. A conditional distribution takes a specific look at a column or row. We want to, if, if we're looking at a very specific variable or even a category within that variable, um, we call that a conditional distribution. And there's a few ways that we can do that. Um, we can look at rows, uh, which would be a row percentage. So that's us taking the data values and comparing it to the row total. We can look at the column percentage, which takes a data value and compares it to the column total. Or we can look at the table percentage, which takes a data value and compares it to the overall total. And how we choose depends entirely on what question uh, we are asking. For example, how does ticket class change between survivors? These are row percentages. So uh, let's, oh, they all came in really funny. Let's just open the whole thing. Uh, so notice that this is the same table that we had in the previous one, the same numbers up above. Now, what we've added here is the row percentage. 
Now, where we got this was we're looking at how tickets class changes between survivors. So notice that between survivors, the way that's phrased, we're making a conditional statement that says we want to first look at the whether or not they survived and see how that changes based on their class. So the alive row, 28.6 of first class survivors, uh, of, of the first class survived. Notice that as these percentages go across, the row percentage adds up to 100%. The column does not. The column, 28.6 plus 8.2, nowhere near 100%. Okay? And these are not adding up to the same number. We are comparing a cell to the row total. So 203 out of 711 is, gets us the 28.6. So if you are alive, what percent were in first class? That's 28.6. So assuming you were alive, 28.6% of those people who are alive uh, were in first class. Assuming you were alive, 29.8% were out of the crew. Okay, If you are dead, 35.4% of you were in the third crew. If you are dead, 45.2% of you uh, were in crew. If you are dead, 8.2% of you were uh, in first class. So looking at the row totals can kind of tell us about um, if we if we looking specifically at survivors where they fell within the classes. So uh, looking at this, obviously uh, uh, being in first class was a whole lot better because of the dead people, only 8.2% of them were in first class, and of the dead people. 11.2% of them were in second class. Of the dead people, 35.4% of them were in third class. Notice that as the class goes down, uh, the, the death toll rises significantly. Now, it, just in case uh, you're not familiar with the Titanic, one of the reasons why that happened is, here's my Titanic, right? My Titanic boat looks an awful lot like my buckets, but notice that, uh, look, and now it's a boat because it's got a thing there. Uh, the first class crew tended to be up here in the top. And the second class crew tended to be down here because uh, the first class did, you had to pay a lot more, so you're lower in the ship. Third class, same thing, you were even lower. In fact, and the crew was often on the very bottom of the boat. So if this boat starts to sink, the people in the bottom of the boat are the ones that are going to be in a lot of trouble, which is why, one of the reasons why significantly more crew members and third class people tended to die rather than the first class. Because if you could make it to the top of the boat, the likelihood of getting into a, uh, one of the lifeboats was significantly higher than if you were in the bottom of the boat. Okay? So looking at this between, as the survivors, we can see it, it looks like it's good to be in first class. It's, it's good to have money, all right? But what if we wanted to, to switch that? Uh, oh, so first of all, we can, by the way, look uh, at these percentages uh, and kind of like space them out in a side-by-side -side bar chart. So here we have um, the, this is the 28.6% of the first class people who uh, were survivors, and then the, um, there's my, my dead first class, there's my dead second class, my dead third, and my dead fourth. Uh, notice again, as you go up here, uh, the, more, the more dead you had, or the more dead you were, okay? Okay, so what if we switch the condition? What if we said, how does survival change based on class? This time, we're changing the conditional statement. And again, those are coming in in the weirdest order right now. Um, but we're gonna change the conditional statement. So instead of it being about uh, we're looking at those people who were alive or those people who were dead, now we're changing the condition to be like, if you're in first class. So we want to focus on just the people in first class, right? So like, let's, uh, let's, let's, let's highlight those. Let's highlight these people. So now we're highlighting the people in first class. Uh, we're not even going to look at these other ones for now. We want to look just at first class. Notice that we're looking at the column of first class. 
if you are in first class, what percent of you would be alive? So if you're in first class, 62.5% of us, of us, I say us as though I have lots of money, I'm a teacher, there's no way I'd be in first class. I would be in the can't afford on this boat class. So, uh, but no, 62.5% uh, of the first class people survived. Notice how that number changed when, from when we were looking at the columns, or excuse me, at the rows, because we were looking at alive versus dead. Now, since we're looking at it in terms of class, the first class people survived significantly more than they were dead. The second class people, if you were in second class, what percent of you would be alive? That's 41.4%. Notice that, again, looking at this, we can see that the second class maybe didn't have it as good as we thought before, because significant higher percentage of dead people were in second class than alive. Now, if we look at the third class and crew, we can see even more so how these guys just got hosed, like totally hosed in terms of, uh, you know, being alive or dead. Um, the third class people, if you were uh, in the third class, what percent of you would be dead? 74.8% of you would be dead, right? That's a huge amount of people died in third class and the crew was just as bad off, right? Uh, because if you were in crew, what percent of you would be dead? 76%. So again, notice how as we change the conditional statement that we can see the percentages change. Changing that, that, uh, that, per that statement allowed us to maybe see into the data a little bit better. And again, we can make a side-by-side -side chart to see whether to see that data um, uh, as a display here. And again, you can, you can just tell. First class, more people lived than died, but every other class, significantly higher chunks of people died than lived. Okay. So what we're going to talk about in the next video, so that's the end of this one, is when we look at this data, um, we're going to talk about this idea called independence, right? In other words, um, are they the same, right? Does one depend on the other? So we will do that in the next video. But so thank you for watching this one. And uh, I hope to see you in the video on independence. So thanks a lot. Bye.